On today's episode of the Yay Do the Radio Show podcast, we're going to continue our discussion about the DR2X and we're going to dive into the little bit more of the technical side of things where we discuss the D sub 15 connector and that 10 pin mini DIN connector, which I think more people are going to be surprised the abilities, what that can and cannot do. That's for today's show, Monday, January 22nd, 2024, on the Yezu, the radio show podcast. And welcome to this episode of the Yezu, the radio show podcast. I'm your host, John Crook. Thank you for tuning in today. This is part of our DR2X repeater series that we've talked about. And Really, with this DR2X repeater series, it's actually, we've gotten some feedback and saying, you know, wow, I guess I didn't really think of that or the concepts of what the DR2X can and can't do. And more so, what exactly is the, that this isn't just really a repeater. This, this really isn't. And, and a lot of people think that it is. This is a standard repeater. Like, you know, you're going to buy a normal repeater and you're going to go ahead and, pro, you know, program it with software. And then it's either VHF only or UHF only or that kind of thing. They don't realize that it's kind of sort of like a Swiss Army tool, if you really kind of think of it from the aspects of what it can do. And um, we're just kind of continuing on the series because as we're starting to dig more and more, we've gotten some calls, some letters and stuff like that from people saying, John, can the repeater do this? Can the repeater do this? I've listened to the first few episodes of the podcast on there, and the answer is yes. Yes, it can do that. But before we dive into this here um, on today's episode where we're talking about the D-Sub 15 connector and the 10-pin mini DIN, the question that comes up is, John, where can I get a repeater? Well, you actually have a couple different options. First of all, go to your local favorite Yezu dealer worldwide and they will be able to go ahead and get you a repeater and that is in places that the repeater is actually allowed to be sold there are some parts of the world where the repeater is actually not able to be sold which okay we're disappointed but go to your favorite Yezu dealer now if you live in the north america market and by north america we mean basically the United States or Canada, we do have the repeater program special running, right? That's in the North America market. It has to be shipped to an address either within the United States or up in Canada, but you can then get our repeater program at a special rate of either $700 or $900 with the land unit installed. That goes until March 31st, right now of 2024. So if you're looking at this podcast, um, whether online or listening to it um, later, if you are after the March 31st, the program is scheduled to end at that time. Don't know if it's going to be renewed, but definitely check into it. If you want to go ahead and get that application for that program, make sure you head over to our System Fusion website. That's http colon forward slash forward slash systemfusion.yezu.com. That's right, System Fusion, one word, dot yezu. Dot com. That's where you can download the uh, application for the program, and you can go ahead then at that point in time, fill out that application and send it in. No discounting super blowout repeaters or anything like that on there. No, nope. order it any time you want at that great discounted price, and they'll be more than happy to get a repeater in your hands, which I think you're going to love and you're going to enjoy. Alrighty, diving into our dis- topic of discussion today, we're gonna di- like I said, it's it's gonna be more technical for you. So if you you are you know if you're like, hey, I, I work with the repeaters a little bit in the club, but I'm not that technical guy, you might you may or may not get some out of here. If you're just a day to day user, you might not get anything out of here. Um, if you are one of the trustees, the people who are in charge of the repeater, you're gonna get stuff out of here. Or maybe this, maybe you're upcoming in your club group organization, or maybe you're interested in buying the repeater. This may be the episode for you. And if not, guess what? It's going to be a great reference tool for you to learn. Okay. So we're going to dive in. So think of the repeater. We're working on the back of the repeater today, and we're going to be concentrating on two points or parts in this podcast, which is going to go ahead and be the D sub 15 connector, as well as the 10 pin mini DIN connector. Now, one of the things I want to stress when we are talking about these connectors is is that they are not a proprietary connector, okay? You can get cables for it, all righty? The part that it comes into play is is that dealing with the D-sub, it is a 
15 pin connector but it's a three rows of five with that one row per se the top row let's call it is sort of staggered a little bit on there okay so if you're looking at the back of the panel you're going to see the first five pins and then it looks the next row down is slightly off to your right then the next row underneath that is slightly back off to the left so the top and the bottom row so the first and the third row those pins almost line up but then the second row is kind of like in between them now that is yes the same looking connector as a vga cable for your computer cable Okay. Do not use a VGA cable. You cannot. You're going to blow out your repeater. And here's why. On a VGA connection, there are certain pins which are, how do you want to say, a jumper together or grounded out within that cable. Some of the pins, or two of the pins, happen to go ahead and be pin 15 with, I believe it's pin 10 or I'm checking maybe pin five. One of those two pins are in a VGA cable jumpered together. In our connector, because we have a lot of stuff coming out of that D sub 15 connector, okay, those ha ones happen to be voltage or DC voltage, which is going to go ahead and give two amps out, and the other happens to be ground. So if you plug a VGA cable into there, turn on your repeater, you're going to fry stuff. So do not, do not, do not, do not, do not use a VGA pre-made cable. You're, you can buy a VGA connector, that 15-pin cable connector, but they you can't have anything soldered onto it because, like I said, you but people are like, oh, we'll just buy a VGA cable, cut it in half, and I got two cables. Uh, 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 no, don't, don't, don't. You're going to have to buy that D-sub-15, a three-row, not like I think it's Apple that has a 15-pin connector, and then it's the top row. I think the top row is, what is it? Top row is, is, is 15 or no, um, I forgot what the split is, but like one's eight and then one's seven, I think it is. No, it's not a two row. It is a true three row. But what we're going to do here today's episode, we're going to walk through it. Now, this information is in the manual. All right. It is in the manual. This is nothing like we're hiding it. But we do have a written document that, that I came up with that has helped people on there. And the reason we want to point this out is, is that so many people come to us and they say, you know, I, I wish the repeater would do this and this, and I had to go out to this company or this company, which buys this extra board for me to do that. And like, no, 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 no. You, you don't have to do that at all. You don't. All the pins are there. You just kind of have to sit down and connect the dots. More people look for a plug and play solution. We understand that. That's fine. But if you want to sit down and take a look at things, this, this is the episode you want to listen to. So first and foremost, there are two states of this D sub 15, okay? There is the, actually you could call three really, if we want to say the non-active state, okay? That means it's not on, not, not at it whatsoever. There is the remote in the menu active state, which means you go in there and turn remote on in the menu system and that will wake up the D sub 15 for selective usage, Okay, and we'll cover that in a minute. But then there is also the full state of usage of the D sub 15. That's going to be turned on in the repeater under remote, and then you have to ground pin one to do it. When you just turn on remote in the repeater, what it does is it wakes up that connector in the back, and then that connector goes ahead and says, okay, well, I'm not going to necessarily transmit through this port or anything like that on there until I see pin one grounded. Then... Hey, pin one's grounded. Now I'm now I'm awake, and now I need to be used. But if you just turn on remote, but don't ground pin one on the D sub fifteen, it's going to go ahead and be in the repeater mode. So the repeat the con internal controller, for sake of a better term, is going to still actively be used. But when you ground pin one, it disables the internal controller. And then it's looking for a keying source externally from like another controller or something like that on there. So that's going to be the kind of the two states on there. Now, some of the advantages the D sub 15 is going to give you, which a lot of people don't realize is, is that obviously it's an input to PTT. So if you ground pin one, you can then go ahead and ground pin two to key, ca cause the repeater to key, and then you would inject your audio in there. Now, one of the other important things that you need to know when using the D sub 15 
is, is that when you use the D sub 15 full activation, right? Remote and pin one grounded, and you push PTT or ground pin two for PTT and send your audio in, using the D sub 15, it is going to strip or eliminate the transmission of the CTCSS or DCS tone you have selected in the menu system of the repeater. So if you are using the D sub 15 and you are going to be injecting audio with it causing the repeater to transmit, if you want to transmit a CTCSS tone with it also, you're gonna to have to have an external source which is then going to feed that tone into that repeater. That is important to understand because we've had people that have said, you know, I'm using it with an external controller and we're trying to use a CTCSS encode so that users in the field can turn on the decode and filter out the digital hash. Okay, cool, fine, not a problem. But then what people are saying is they're saying, John, um, uh, I, I, I can't get the decode to, or the encode on the repeater to work. I have a program that I checked and everything, but it's not encoding. Right, when using the PTT from the D sub 15, it strips that CTCSS um, tone that's programmed into the repeater from the front panel. Now, next part on the D sub 15 is going to be pins three and pins four. Now, this is where we say a lot of people are saying, oh, I need to go ahead and I need to have a board and, and this and this and this and this. Uh, you, you really don't, okay? If, if you're using an external controller and you're gonna use that controller for analog, that's great. There's no external controller that's gonna let you run digital. There isn't. Digital is going to have to still be done by the internal controller of the repeater. Now, the issue comes into play is saying, well, wait a minute here. How do I, how does, how does the controller know when to work and when not to work? And that's a very good question. Well, this is where you're going to want to take a look at pins three and pins four. All righty. Starting, and we're going to do this a little backwards here, starting with pin four, not pin three, but pin four, that is the squelch detect. Now, what that squelch detect does is anytime the repeater receives a signal on the receive frequency of the repeater, doesn't matter if it matches the correct tone, doesn't matter if it's an actual signal to be used. If So, for example, let's say it's 147.600 and your repeater needs a tone of 110.9, and let's say a signal of 147.600 comes in, but it doesn't have 110.9, doesn't matter. The repeater still sees a signal on the receiver. So pin four is going to go to ground, okay? It's gonna to go to ground, okay? So what that means then is it's saying, okay, wait a minute here, wait a minute here, wait a minute here. I have a signal present so now what I have to do is I have to let the controller know that that signal might be coming in. This is going to play a part when in a minute here. So now we're going to go back up to pin three. Now pin three is the CTCSS DCS signaling line. So what that means is, is that pin three now is only going to go active when there is an FM signal that matches the CTCSS or DCS tone program the repeater. So for an example, someone keys up on 147.600, no tone. Pin four is gonna go ground because it's saying, hey, I'm hearing a signal. Pin three is gonna stay open. It's not gonna ground out because it's saying, yeah, there's a signal there, but it's not the right PL tone or CTCSS tone. But now let's say we have 147.600 and it has a 110.9 and that's what your repeater's listening to. Pin three and pin four are both gonna go ground. Now, why is that important? That is how you're going to be pulling your core or cost sense, your carry operated relay sense or your carry operated squelch sense off of that repeater feeding into your controller. So what you would have to do then is, is that if you want the repeater to only work in FM, you want to pull your core cost sense off pin three because pin three is only going to active when go active or I should say go low when you have a signal on the frequency and the correct and corresponding CTCSS or DCS tone programmed in the repeater. Okay, so when you set up your repeater, you set up your receive and transmit frequency or uplink and downlink as we call it. And then you set the corresponding tones between the uplink and downlink frequency. So the uplink going into the repeater, once again, 147.6 in our example, 110.9. Oh, pin three and pin four are gonna go active. Hey, 147.6 and no 
CTCSS tone, pin 4 active, pin 3 is not. That is how you turn on and off your external controller for, hey, if it needs to work or not. Now, this is also important if you have other devices on there that you, like I said, you want to audio bridge, those kind of things like that on there. So use that in mind for your carrying costs. A lot of people will go pin four automatically, which is squelch detect. And then they're saying, yeah, now I'm getting the hash of digital. Why am I getting in there? Because that pin is going to go active ground when the, when the signal is detected. All right. So now pin five is ground, which is very simple. Now, Pin 6 and pin 7 go hand in hand. Because remember, when using the PTT from the back of the D-sub-15, it is not going inst- to transmit a tone. Pin 6 is where you're going to have to inject that CTCSS or DCS tone. So you're going to need to have a tone board or a tone generation source. That's going to go in on pin 6. Now, that port goes ahead and and has a range on there that it likes to listen for the frequencies, okay? So it does have, it's a 600 ohm, 500 millivolt, 500 millivolt peak-to-peak freak, uh, signal in there that needs to be injected for that tone. So just kind of keep that in mind. And it's designed for 5 to about 250 hertz, right? Because that's the, I mean, it goes, goes CTCSS tone lowest one is about 67 hertz, but the highest one's about 250.3. So it's going to cover those CTCSS tones that you need, as well as your DCS tones. Watch out, though, because if you have over-deviation, it's going to splatter, and then that CTCSS tone and DCS tone transmitted is not going to be able to decode very well. Okay, You want to use shielded cable for this connector, too. So you want to make sure you have something that the shield of that cable is connecting to ground because you need a pure audio source on there. Now, pin 7 is your audio in. This would be your mic high from the controller. So coming out of the controller, your mic input, your mic, your, so audio out of the controller goes into pin 7. Once again, that's going to have a, a voice range of three to 3,000 hertz. Make sure you ground this cable. So many times people go ahead and, and don't ground that cable correctly, and then you have a buzzing or a humming noise in the back. All right, now... Pin 8 is going to give you AF out. Now, I should almost say discriminator out is going to be the better thing. Because that's going to be flat audio. But it's also going to be flat analog audio. But it's also going to go ahead and be pure digital noise. So if someone's using that repeater in digital and you connect an audio source on pin 8, you're going to hear the bad noise of digital while someone's talking digital. If you need flat audio out of your controller for analog, you're going to have to tap off pin 8, but then you're also going to have to make sure you're only using pin 3 on that. Because if you do, once again, pin 4, that's going to be signal whatsoever. So if it's digital signal or analog signal, it's always going to go active high, or excuse me, active low to cause the controller to wake up. And pin 8 is just, you're going to hear digital hash and you're going to hear flat audio. But if you're using it something where you can use. Basically, um, how do I say modulated audio and what I like to call recovered digital audio. This is where you want to use pin 9. Pin 9 is going to put out modulated audio. So analog FM signal come in, you're going to hear the digital audio. But then what pin 9 also does is it also allows the digital audio converted back to analog or what we like to call it recovered digital audio and sends it down that pin also too. Now this is going to be good if you have a repeater that is operating in an AMS mode but then you're feeding it into a controller for like linking purposes that's going out to an analog system. I do that on my repeater system. I have the users use AMS, so analog or digital, comes in, I pull the audio off pin 9 if I need to, that goes into the controller, and that goes out down the line. So analog is going to go in analog, or the repeater recovers digital analog, puts it in analog, puts it in the controller, and sends it down the line. Okay, Pin 10 is another grounding port. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cover pins 11 and 12. 13, 14, and 15 are some other ones that some people use and some people don't use. Well, we're going to worry about that. I want to get through this and then, of course, the D-sub-15 connector. Now, pin 11 and 12 become active 
when you're in the remote active state. So once again, this is turning the remote function on in the menu system of the DR2X, but you are not grounding pin one. This is that remote active state. Pin 11 is and 12 are gonna become active. Now in the manual, there is a table on there, which is goes by port one and port two, which is pins 11 and pins 12. And then it's gonna say what the status of those pins are. So remember high and low. So high means the pins are not grounded. Low in this case would mean the pins are grounded. And you will see that there is a difference. There is four combinations to pins 11 and 12, which will produce four different responses. So if you do not ground pins 11 and 12, it will be AMS receive fixed digital out. If you ground 11 and 12, it will be AMS receive and AMS transmit. If you ground pin 11 and keep pin 12 high, so do not ground pin 12, it will be digital, digital, digital receive, digital transmit. And if you leave pin 11 high or ungrounded, but ground pin 12, you then go AMS receive and then FM fixed transmit. Now there is no FM receive only and FM transmit on the DR2X. The closest you're gonna get is AMS receive and fixed FM out, okay? So that's where you have those pin combinations. Once again, those are gonna become active. And the reason I wanted to stress this part is, is because when you're looking at the operation of the DR2X, some people will think if I wanna use DTMF commands for the remote or fusion telecommands, they have to turn on that remote. No, the remote option in the DR2X basically refers to the D sub 15 becoming active or not on there. Now, once again, a lot of people go ahead and saying, you know, John, okay, you've just referenced the manual on here, the D, the 10 pin mini DIN, which we're going to talk about here, that is also referenced in the manual. Where can I get the manual? Okay, even if you're not a repeater owner, I want to read up on this. I want this kind of stuff is cool. All righty, where can I do that? And what you're going to do is you're going to want to go to our yezu.com website. That's right, yezu.com. What you're going to do is when you come up on the website, go underneath in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the word products. Hover your mouse over the word products. A drop-down menu is going to come. You can select digital. And then along the top, you're going to go ahead and see the repeater, the, the picture of the repeater. Click on that picture of the repeater. And then what's going to happen is, is that you're going to have it where it's going to go to that landing page. Click on the files tab. Once you click on the files tab, you can download the DR2X manual. And in the back of that DR2X manual is going to have these pins out for the D sub 15 as well as the 10 pin mini DIN. Yes, that's correct. Yezu.com. Go ahead and go to the landing page for the DR2X. Click on files and download the manual. The manual isn't in a PDF format. So if you want to download it on your favorite type of e-reader cell phone smartphone tablet whatever whatever you use or hey if you don't want to have a digital only copy you can go ahead and take it and go print out at your home on your pdf or if you want to you can go ahead and print out at a local print stop that's fine whatever you want here is the manual for you no need to worry about trying to get your hands on it anytime it's there 24 7 on yezu.com all righty so that was the D sub 15 we talked about. Let's talk about the 10 pin mini DIN. Now the 10 pin mini DIN is a unique pin on the back of the repeater. You do not have to turn anything on for the 10 pin mini DIN to work. In addition, when you key or put a PTT signal on the 10 pin mini DIN, it leaves the encode for your tone on the transmitter of the repeater. So if you want to go ahead and transmit, let's say this tone, once again, our example, 110.9, it's not going to strip that tone when you do the PTT on there. Now, the biggest thing you got to understand about the 10-pin mini DIN is the first six pins are, in essence, like a six-pin data jack. They reference the same thing. The last four pins, 7, 8, 9, and 10, are used with operations like connecting an HRI 200 directly to the repeater, um, um, control of, of the digital side of things on there. You're going to find the same 10 pin mini DIN on our, our radios also too, our mobile radios on there. So, you know, like the FTM 200, 300, 500, those kind of things on there. But we're only going to deal with the first six. So disregard seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That's for digital, 
digital data between devices. Don't need to worry about that on there. What we're going to start off is is the pin pin one through six. We're going to kind of go through them real quick. So pin one is going to be PKD, which is packet data input. That is going to be your audio input on this one. Okay, you can use flat or you can use modulated. It all depends on what you're interfacing in to that port. Now, I've done some connections with all-star nodes and other sort of things like that in there, whatever, whatever. And really, depending on what kind of audio you can have coming out of the device you're using to inject into to that 10-pin minute in is really going to determine between flat or going ahead and determining if we need to have like modulated audio. Pin 2 is ground, and a ground is a ground is a ground, right? Pin 3 is PKS, okay, which is Packet King Squelch. Reason it's kind of <clears throat> kind of says it weird like that on there, but that's going to be your PTT. When you take pin three and you apply that to ground, that is going to cause the repeater to transmit. Okay. Now pins four and pins five, they do the same thing, but just a little differently. So pin four is going to be the received ninety six hundred baud. That is going to be like pin eight up at the top. Remember where it's going to go ahead and be sort of like a discriminator output where it's going to give you flat analog audio output, but it's also going to give you the digital hash. If you want that recovered audio for digital and modulated receive FM audio, you need to go to pin five, which is going to be the receive 1200. Receive 1200 is going to give you a modulated FM and recovered digital audio. When I've done this on some of my link um, repeaters and stuff like that that I have, I use the 1200 baud. Now, the reason I like to use the 1200 baud is because, once again, it's going to give me, on that receive 1200 pin, it's going to give me analog or digital. Users can be using digital via RF, converts that RF signal received on the back side on that 10-pin mini DIN, puts it to analog, allows me to send it down through my link system, whatever I need to. Now, analog users on the other part of the system can hear me and go back and forth. Alrighty, it's really going to be nice. Now, the final pin that we're going to be talking about is pin six, which is PK squelch or packet squelch. Now, this is different, folks. This is going to be very, very different. When you're using the D sub 15, Pins three and pins four, remember, go active low, meaning they go to a ground state when there is, remember, pin four is a signal and pin three is going to be when there's actual a proper decode of the CTCSS or DCS tone. With this pin six on the 10 pin mini DIN, it is going to act like pin three with an exception. So pin three will go active, remember up at the top of the D sub 15, okay, will go active when it receives a signal and the proper CTCSS or DCS code. Packet squelch, the sick pin number six on the D sub, or the 10 pin mini DIN, not the D sub, but pin six on the 10 pin mini DIN, will go and become active when it receives a signal and the proper CTCSS tone. However, this time it's going to go active high. Okay, active high. Complete opposite. So what that means is when there's no signal sitting on the repeater, the repeater isn't receiving any signal whatsoever and has no decode tone it's receiving, it's going to be active low. The minute it receives a signal with the proper uh, CTCSS or DCS tone, pin 6 on the 10-pin mini DIN is going to go active high, and that's like plus 3 volts reference to ground. Okay? That's a big change. That's what you need to be aware of. Now, most of the time, that's not going to be an issue because most controllers can either be looking for an active high or an active low signal. They can. It's not a problem whatsoever. Okay? But, 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 when you're using the 10-pin uh, mini DIN, like I like to use more often or not, then you got to deal with that issue. Now, why do I like to use the 10-pin mini DIN? Well, the reason I like to use the 10-pin mini DIN is because, once again, when you key with the 10-pin mini DIN, it is going to use the frequency and the tone programmed into the repeater. It's not going to strip that CTCSS or DCS tone. 
But the flip side is, is that when you're looking for that active core sense, aha, you're going to be having a positive or an active high core sense on there. So j these are just kind of some of the things that you need to go ahead and think and be aware of. Is there a difference? Is there really a difference between the two? No, there's not. There really isn't. The D sub 15 gets more granular, okay? Whereas the 10 pin mini den has kind of like, well, this is this does this, this is this, and this and this. One thing I'm gonna tell you though, that the DR2X offers that the DR1 series did not. And I like this for the 10 pin mini din. And this is why 10 pin mini din was not a great solution on the DR1 series, but is a great solution on the DR2X. So if you notice on the 10 pin mini din, there's no selection of the mode of operation. It's going to go by what's ever programmed on the front of the repeater. So if you have AMS, AMS, or um, AMS FM fixed, AMS digital fixed, digital, digital, whatever you have, okay, that's going to be on the front of the repeater. But one thing that the 10 pin mini din will do that the once again, the DR1X did not, and I want to stress that, is, is that if you have the repeater in AMS mode and you ground the PTT pin on the 10 pin mini din. So basically what you're doing is you're going to go ahead and then key up the repeater using pin three by pulling that on the 10 pin mini din to ground and then injecting your audio on pin one. What's going to happen is in AMS mode, the repeater will default to FM. In AMS mode on the DR1X did not do that. If it was in AMS mode and you tried keying a sort signal in for the back, didn't know what the hell to do. Just sat there and kind of did nothing. Like, oh, I'm sorry, can't do it. DR2X, completely different. If you're in AMS mode and you key from the external source on there, like I've talked about, the 10 pin mean in, always going to default to FM. This is great. And this is why I love this so much because I can then take All Star, which I like using All Star, but you could use IRLP, you could use Echo Link, you could use something else, another controller, linking controller, whatever you want to do on there. But if you have signals coming in that are analog and you, and, and you want analog users to hear it, AMS is automatically going to do that. Now, the best part in this case is, is that, hey, users running AMS in the field. How's it going to operate in the field? So I'm using AMS in the field. Hey, N9 UPC is monitoring, right? I go in AMS. So let's say I went in FM on my radio. Well, AMS heard it, rebroadcast on other Peter's FM. Then it goes down on that 10 pin mini din out the link as FM. Now, someone's coming in that link, All Star, IRLP, Echo Link, whatever, whatever, coming in the repeater is going to automatically force over to FM. Now, let's say I'm a digital user, okay? Have, I'm transmitting digital, but I'm in AMS mode. Boom, key up, and I need PC. Nice digital, repeater is going to repeat it out as digital. But once again, on that 10-pin mini in this case, it's going to convert it, if you're using the receive 1200 pin, going to convert it to FM and then send it down the line. Now, so those Echo Link users, those IRLP, those All-Star users want to reply back to me. Yeah, guess what? It's going to come back out. It's going to force it into FM. However, I am in AMS mode. Doesn't bother me. Now I can go back. And you can, you see, so it adds more functional, functionality and um, abilities to the repeater. All right, so that was, like I said, today's episode was more of that techie side of things, working out pins and stuff like that on there. Really, when you're you're connecting to controller, it's really kind of following the Electron is what I kind of tell when you're interfacing controller. Now, there is not a specific controller that does or does not work with the DR2X. I guess I really want to stress that because I've heard some people say, oh, well, well, will this, will brand A work with the repeater? Because I don't know, um, I don't, I have brand A, but someone has brand B and I don't have brand B and they said it works, but I don't know this and this and this and this. Yeah, any controller work. You just may have to do the wiring on there. They may not be a full cable, but as you see, it has all the all the options on there. A lot of people say, I need an interface board to, to kick it out from digital to analog and to turn off the... No, you don't. All the pins are on there. You just have to know how to interface and make that connection for you. Yezu, of course, doesn't test with third-party devices or repeater controllers or anything like that on there, so we don't know how that works, so we can't say, ah, yes, on this model of repeater controller wired up this way and not. We try to help you out the best that we can by kind of saying, well, this pin is going to do this and this pin is going to do this, but on your end, you'll have to kind of draw and connect those dots. So thanks for tuning in to this episode. 
Once again, this is part of our mini-series here on the DR2X, some of the features and everything like that. Tune in for the next episode, which is going to be episode 11, which will be the final episode of the DR2X series, where we're going to talk about controlling via DTMF as well as some Fusion Telecommands, what you got to do to set it up in Fusion Telecommand. A lot of people get confused in there. That's why we have a whole episode dedicated to that. So until then, everybody, I want everybody to have a good time. And this is Yezu USA saying 73, and we'll catch you on the band. <laughs>